John chapter 4. How many of you know your Bible well enough to know automatically what's in John chapter 4? It's the woman at the well. The woman of Samaria. This is the kind of preaching I like to do. Because, well, I don't know, I was sitting there thinking about it and and I think, you know, well, I, when I started looking at this yesterday, I was just overwhelmed again because it, there's just so much. And and the reason that it's that way is because the older you get, the more you begin to understand people and human nature and the way things are in this world and the roads that lead to the same places. And, and so you just kind of know. And then you come to Jesus and you see how he deals with these people. It's so personal. It's not, it's not to the multitudes. You know, to the multitudes, really. Now consider how much good was done speaking to the multitudes. Well, we have no way of idea of measuring for sure, but where do we see the real conversions, the real results one-on-one? -on -one? The stories that are recorded in the Gospels of the individual people that Jesus dealt with and that he went out of his way to deal with. <coughs> Divine appointments. Hmm. And it reminds me, when I see this, I relate it to so many cases that I've known through the years and to my own as well. And that's what makes it so rich and sweet. John chapter 4. Let's read the first 10 verses. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, parentheses, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into, the Gal into Galilee. He must needs go through Samaria. Well, that's just a geographical fact. If you look at the map, if you're in Judea and you're going to Galilee, you got to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. There are some names from the past that are associated with the place. Now Jacob's well was there. Go back and read about Jacob and that well. Still given water. Some somebody had dug out of the earth a long time ago. Still blessing. Still a place where somebody can find God. Jesus, therefore, being worried with his journey, sat thus on the well. I thought about this the other day. You know, when Jacob dug that well, did he have any idea that one day who would sit there? No, neither do we in the things that we do. In, the, in our labors for Christ, therefore, that's why he says, be not weary in well-doing. You know, for your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keeps yielding fruit. Jesus, therefore, being word with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There come a, cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, hast drink of me, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Oh, we've read that so many times. So many times. But it looks different to me now. The disciples went into the city to buy meat. And Jesus stayed at the well. He didn't go with them. They weren't as keen to the needs around them as he was because they were focused on their own needs. They were hungry. 
Supper time. We got to get something to eat. I mean, what's pressing here? Eating. We're hungry. Never mind the people around. Never mind what's at stake around. What I need right now is what's most. It overrides everything. They went to town to get something to eat. Jesus stayed there by himself. As long as we live in pursuits, in pursuit of our own needs and cares, we'll be oblivious to those around us. You hear me? As long as all that we care about and live for is what I need, what I want, what I, uh, what I uh, think, then we're oblivious to those that are around us. How many people do we pass by just like they did? Do you ever think about this? They were not looking for any opportunity to bring someone to Jesus, but only looking after their own bellies. That's the disciples of Christ. That's the chapter where Jesus, this is the same chapter where down in verse 35 he talks about, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Everybody's always getting ready for something. They're getting ready to do something. They're going to do something. They're hoping to do something. But while they're looking into the future, the present is perishing around them. He said, don't be looking, say three months from now we'll be able. No, today. Right now. Today is the day of salvation. Today there are needy people all around us. Today, there's an opportunity for us to show somebody toward Jesus, point them toward Jesus. Yes. yes sir. Today. They're all around us. We're just not looking because we're hot after our own needs and cares. Jesus stayed out of the town and at the well because he had a divine appointment there. The city is where the people were. I had a guy tell me that one time. Got into a big ruckus with him because that's what his argument was that everybody ought to live in the city because that's where the people are. And all the Christians ought to go to the city if you want to win people to God. Jesus didn't. He stayed out of the city for one person. He went across the sea for one person. That's right, yes, sir. He dealt very personally with people, individually with people, and he still does. And we miss that and we neglect that because we got this corporate idea of how we do things and how the work of God works and how our lives are. are. But, you know, what does it matter what all the Lord has done in her life up until this point? I don't, you know, life and sin has brought her to this well this day. Yes. <laughs> and Jesus has very few words, very simple message that rescues her from all of it. The cities where the people were, but he stayed there alone where no one was. When he stayed there, there was no one there. This woman came after they left. A fisher of men can find them everywhere. That's right, yes, sir. And the quieter places are always the best place to fish anyway, don't you all know that? <laughs> In chapter 3 of John, he talked to a Pharisee, a religious, educated, law-abiding, lost person. I think it's amazing the differences in these people and that we ought to take note and pay attention to the different kinds of people that Jesus dealt with individually like this and how he did it. The woman, you know... The woman is just about as far the opposite of a Pharisee as you can get. Wouldn't you say so? Yes, this woman? <laughs> she's, uh, she's morally bankrupt. She's well known among the men in town as such. And then she's a Samaritan to boot. Nicodemus knew about religion and the law and worship, but this woman only knew what she had heard about from the old people where she lived. Our fathers say that's all she had, that's all the knowledge she had of God and religion is our fathers say that in this mountain we ought to worship. That's all she knew. Hearsay. Second hand. Knew nothing else. 
Nicodemus came to Jesus. Jesus came to the woman. Think about that. Nicodemus came to Jesus seeking to confirm who he was. Jesus stayed there for the woman to, to show her who he was. It's amazing to watch how Jesus deals with her. Brings her to a knowledge and understanding of salvation. You see, Nicodemus went there on purpose. She didn't go there on purpose. He was waiting on her when she got there. Mark that. The difference between a religious person and a sinner. You're sitting here in church this morning listening. Have most of you most of your life. That woman hadn't. There's people all around us that haven't. How's God ever going to reach them? How are they ever going to be saved? We hear it and hear it. And people that sit in church here, just like Nicodemus, you know all about it, but you got no real experience. How can you be a master of Israel and you don't know these things? Same things he's fixing to teach this woman. This woman was a sinful woman. And, her, and so her attitude toward others was the same as all sinners. These are things I've learned in life. They all have the same attitude practically. They all have a different facade on the, They'll be wearing a different coat maybe, but when you poke them a little bit, the same junk comes out of them. They all got the same attitude, the same perception. She made a lot of bad choices. It had left her with a reputation and now... She has no hope, Gary, you're just talking about. She has no hope of ever being anything but what she is. She's done had five husbands, and the one she's with is not her husband, and where do you go from there? Where do you go from there in this world as a woman? What are your options? No, you see, she didn't, wasn't looking forward in life. She wasn't looking forward nowhere. She was looking down. Just like all lost people do. They're just like the beast that look to the ground and they never look up. That's what causes sinners to take on that defensive attitude toward others. Her response to his first words to her were rude and upbraiding. She answered Jesus rough. Every sinner's like that. Always on the defense. Have you talked to enough of them to figure that out? As long as you'll talk their talk, if you'll talk what they want to talk about, but you bring God into it, you bring any kind of uh, about their sin into it, you don't even have to do that. He's not done that yet. He's just, she knows he's a Jew. And she knows what she is. And so she feels condemned by even being there in his presence. And then he speaks to her and asks her for a drink. Every sinner's like that. He's always on the defense. Thinks every, he feels like everybody's out to put one over on him or take advantage of him in some way or put him down. And so his first response to others is usually to fire that warning shot with words, hard words. Almost threatening words. Words of contempt. She saw that Jesus had nothing to draw with and he, that he was weary. Jesus being wearied with the journey. Can you tell when you look at somebody if they've been, if they're weary? Yeah, I look at y'all, especially on Wednesday night. Yeah, they're weary. If I could give you a drink of something that would cheer you up, I would. But this woman looked at Jesus. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't care one bit about him being thirsty or the fact that he didn't have nothing to draw with. She came with a, with a pot to draw water. He didn't have any way because she said so herself. She was there to get her water and her thirst. His thirst was his problem, not hers. Of course, he was a Jew. How did she know he was a Jew? Did he have a button that said, I'm a Jew, on it? Star. No. 
You mean people can tell who other people are just by being around them a minute? Yeah. By the way they dress, by the way they look, and yeah. That's a pretty given thing. We do the same thing. We give, you know, we figure out where people are from by just listening to them talk for a minute, don't we? Sometimes they're wrong. Like that guy in Pennsylvania would ask me, where are you from, South Carolina? I, dummy, I ain't in South Carolina. I'm from Missouri. But anyway, he was a Jew. She'd had a lot of bad experiences with Jews. Jews were religious people. And they were very, generally speaking, they were very, they were known to be haughty and didn't want to have anything to do. That's her perception. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You have nothing to do with us. Because we are, we're less than what you think we ought to be. You don't have, you know, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. So her perception of the Jews was they didn't want anything to do with her or her kind. I've heard it out of people just straight as it can be just like that. We didn't think you'd want us, you know, people like us in your church. I've had people say that to me. Lord have mercy. I hope that they don't get that from me, from my attitude, from my spirit, or from you and yours. That they wouldn't be welcome here. Right. Or that we would feel like we didn't... Or that they could feel that we didn't want anything to do with them. That's exactly how most sinners perceive church people now and always have. And it's their guilt that makes them act the way they do. Sinners think that way and think evil, but there are always plenty of Pharisees around to confirm their opinions of religious people. No matter how hard you try, how many, you know, there's still going to be somebody around. I don't know how many times that I've seen it happen, you know, try to deal with somebody and, and, and they're coming along and showing an interest and softening up toward things and then somebody come, you know, some church person come along and say some bunch of stupid nonsense thinking they're being spiritual when they're not being spiritual at all and offend for no cause, no reason, no good can come of it. Why? Well, this woman been through that enough times. Here she is facing another Jew. You think she's got any hope that he's going to help her? Obviously not. Although she is unkind to him and didn't receive him well, that didn't keep Jesus from showing her kindness and reaching out to her. But his gracious offer of help to her, she responded again, somewhat with contempt and unbelief. You know, he said, if thou knewest the gift of God. She didn't offer it. He said, give me the drink. And she said, you know, you're a Jew. You don't have anything to do with us. How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh of me drink? I'm a Samaritan. And he said, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that asketh of thee, thou would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. See, notice the difference. He asked her and she answered him that way. Then he answered her, I would give to you. You know, if you would just, if you only knew, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that's speaking to you, you would have asked and I would have given I wouldn't treat you that way. That's the Lord, see. It's supposed to be like Him. Yes, sir. The woman saith unto him, verse 11 and 12, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou the, that living water? Art thou, listen to this, art thou greater than our father Jacob? Do you Do you see the contempt and the 
and the disrespect, really. She said, sir, but that is the only thing in there. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? See, so she's reaching way back to her ancestry and everything in the history to stand upon against him. We don't even have none to draw with. How are you going to give me anything? She didn't think he had anything to offer because she couldn't see it at hand. To her, all that all it was was just words that didn't mean anything. Do you understand? That's just how a sinner feels. Mm-hmm. How do you get past all that? Well, watch, watch. This is the state of the heart of all who are lost in sin and think there's nothing anyone can do for them now. <laughs> the Lord, the, uh, the lost, they don't think that we really have anything to offer them. They don't. They think we're just all talk. Because they're blind. They don't see. They're caught up in themselves. And they're looking at the very present circumstances and they can't see beyond that. They have no hope. They have no hope. They think it's over for them. It's done. This is what I am. This is what I'm going to be. And I don't see any way out. I had my chance. Nah. They cry out to God in their soul. Do you? I believe that. I know that. Man, when I was a kid, I'd pray every night when I'd get into bed. I'd pull the covers up over my head and say this little dumb prayer that really didn't mean anything, but it helped me go to sleep because I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe that'll take care of it. Huh. You'd be surprised what goes on in the heart and mind of sinners. They cry out to God in their soul, but all they can see is their prob- is the problems of their life. And they don't know what to ask for or who to ask. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that talketh with thee, speaketh with thee. Jesus started at the end and he worked backwards in this thing. That's something that I found out about the Bible that is so, so interesting. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. If you only knew what God could do, woman of Samaria, if you only knew what... Now, nothing has been mentioned about her life. Her, as far as she know, knows, he don't know a thing about her. But he knows all about her. He's fixing to tell her all that she ever did. But she don't know that. She thinks so far that he's just another man. Just another man that's way up above her in society. And he's just messing with her hair. Messing with her mind. Hmm. If you only knew what God could do. You know, that's the message that sinners ought to hear. Even if we don't know all about their life. I mean, it, that's for the, the lowest depraved sinner on the face of the earth. Or that's for the ones that are all dressed up and in church this morning. They're in the same mess in their soul. If you only knew what God could do and whose voice it is that's speaking to you, you'd ask. <laughs> who is it that I mean how does this thing work does God call yes he does that how did I ever get saved well because Jesus came to me that's right yes, sir. he found me I didn't find him really just like this woman of Samaria when she left town was she looking for this no it's just another day another trip to that well same old monotonous hard laborious life that's a burden but not this day 
Not this day. Somebody waiting for her. <laughs> he didn't come for a drink. He came for her. He didn't stay there to get him a drink. He stayed there to give her a drink. Think about it. Do you have that experience in your life? I mean, when Jesus really came to you. We very seldom understand that they know nothing about salvation and have no idea what to do with their sin and guilt and the mess they've made of their life. We just assume they do. We hear it so much that we think everybody knows, but everybody don't know. No. They hear the voice of condemnation in their soul, but don't know who it is that's speaking to them. The woman like Nicodemus, can't comprehend spiritual things and she's stuck in her earthly carnal thinking and she still thinks he's talking about that water in the well. She just can't get away from that. Just like Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? Can he enter again into his mother's womb? Same thing, see. He's talking about spiritual things. She keeps, She's stuck in the carnal, worldly, earthly Temporal things. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Man, there's... That's a that's that's a whole other message altogether. But when Jesus gives you water, He don't just give you a drink. He puts the fountain in you, and there's a there's a wa the water of life flows out of you. Out of thy belly shall flow rivers of living water. Is that what it says? Yes. And she's just thinking about another pot full of water. And how hard it is to have to do this. And how to do it over and over. The woman saith unto him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You see? Take this load off of me. Lord, this life is hard. And if I could just get out and under all the burdens of life, if life would just be easier, well, there's the slippery place where a lot of people slip right off into hell because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for life to be easier here. And they miss it. All she wanted was relief from life. We better be careful about us wanting Jesus to come so we can get out of here, so we can escape all this. It's the wrong way. It's the wrong desire to have. She's still looking down, not up. She's looking down that well. Give me this water so I don't have to come here and draw again. But this is where Jesus brought up her sin. Isn't that amazing? He said, Jesus saith unto her, verse 16, Go, and, go call thy husband and come hither. <laughs> so... Why did he say it like that? He brought up her sin in such an indirect way like that. Go get your husband. Well, he knew she he knew her situation. You see, every sinner has to be brought to the bench in honesty. And she didn't answer honest. How did she answer? Well, she, she, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Right. Now see what, a, what, a, what guile she spoke with? See how she's trying to deceive? See how she's squirming and trying to cover her sin herself? I don't have a husband. Of course, Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In this thou saidest, in, thi in that saidest thou truly. Well, now that set her back right there. And the first thing she said after that was, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. 
Because who's going to bring up her sin except the prophet? Pharisees don't really bring up your sin. They just pick on you and try to hold you to standards that you don't have no idea what they're talking about. This is sin. This is what wrecked her life. This is what's got her in bondage. This is what's got her trapped where she can't see no future or have any hope. And he put his finger right on it and made her admit it. <laughs> she was not completely honest with him. She spoke with guile to hide her sin and her shame, but it didn't do her any good. Jesus opened the whole, he opened the whole keg of worms on her and told her all things that ever she did. Verse 29 and 39 says it twice in this chapter as you go on through. He told me everything I ever did. Not just about the five husbands. He knew it all. It was like her whole life flashed in front of her eyes. You know that kind of a thing? Every wrong thing I ever did flashed right before my eyes. Well, that changes the whole picture. What did she do? Well, whatever sinner does, she turned to religion. She wanted to talk religion with him. I've seen so many people do that. I've been talking to people that had a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other hand. And cussing and taking God's name in vain and everything else. And then bring up the subject of God and salvation and they just immediately flip and start talking spiritual stuff. I got to mill about a year ago probably. Well, it hadn't been a year because it's been since Dad got sick, but... Uh, he come up to the mill and that's what he was doing. He was just a cussing and a raring and a carrying on and and uh, we got we kept talking about the lumber and all that and I said something about we're building a church over there at Elsinore. Oh, you're building a church. Well, where's it at? Well, then he went to tell me and his sister's a preacher and a pastor and he's helped start so many churches and then he just went to talk about the Holy Ghost and being filled with the Holy Ghost and is exactly what this woman did here. <laughs> he said, you, you've had five husbands. Now you're shacking with another one. It ain't your husband. Well, now our fathers say that in Jerusalem is the place that men ought to worship. What do you think about that? <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? That's where they run for cover. Yes. She had a uh, uh, a veil or whatever you want to call it of religion she had a she had something that she could run to to try to cover it more our fathers my fathers they were religious they worshiped God I mean I'm not all bad I mean my family I know some of my family that weren't like me just because I've turned out this way I mean Let's have a religious question and answer game here. Let's debate about some things and figure out the way things really are. I've had this so many times in my life, so many different ways. Well, what do you think about speaking in tongues? Well, what do you think about the mysteries of the Bible? What do you think about this and that and the other when we need to be talking about where you're at with God and the real problem between you and God? Let's debate about things and figure out the way things are alive. Let's figure out the right way to worship. But let's not talk about my sin anymore. But Jesus did what he always does. He brought her to understand that there's another realm of existence. See, he didn't even focus on her sin right there. I mean, it's already spilled out. There it was. She knew that he knew. And he knew that she knew that he knew. So why we have to keep beating on that? It's all out, and that's all that needs to be done. Right. She knows she's guilty, and she knows that it's wrong. So we don't need to just keep going round, round that Mary go round, and just saying you got to admit it. Now you don't you won't you admit? But you're a terrible woman, won't you just admit? No, he went right straight to the same thing he did with Nicodemus. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're not talking about water. We're not talking about earthly things. We're talking about the fact that 
If you're going to live forever, you're going to have to be born again of the Spirit of God. We're talking about a different... The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he'll tell us all things. See? It's someday in the future. Someday in the future. Think about that. Again, the disciples. Don't say three months and then the harvest. Oh, people always looking in the future. It's going to be. We're going to have. We're going to do. We're going to be. No, it's right now. Right now. She said, I know that someday the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, it'll all be all right and we'll all understand. Is that what Mary said? Or, or Martha, I mean? Or which one was it? it Mar Martha said, uh, Sir, Lord, I know that when in the resurrection, you know, at the last day, he'll rise. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. That means right now. Right now. He that believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? <laughs> That's at Lazarus' grave. So that's what the Bible means when it says today is the day of salvation. Jesus saith unto her, this, He started and came to this. This is the end of the conversation with her. But He started at the beginning by saying, If you just knew. If you just knew. He saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. Anybody ever tell, you know, ask you, did Jesus ever plainly say who he was? The Bible is full of, the Gospels are full of it. He said it a number of times. And in fact, and was it in John chapter 8? I am that I am. You tell him that I am. You know, even, Jesus said, he was referring back to Moses saying that, but Jesus said, before Abraham was. I am. That did it. That did it. They picked up rocks, stones to stone him. Yeah. He, he made it clear who he was. You see, that's when it. That's when the thing happens. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. When you're born again, is that moment when you realize who he really is. And who it is that's speaking to you. You feel the condemnation. And you feel the hopelessness. And all of that. And there's all kinds of thoughts and voices that come through your mind. But you don't know who is speaking unto you. Now she knew who it was that was speaking to her. And she knew about the gift of God. So what did she do? was the next thing that woman did. Well, the disciples showed up about that time. She left her water pot. Yeah, she left it. She took off without it. Her cares of life, her burdens of life, <laughs> she left them. Life meant more from that day forward than up to that point. Life meant more to her than just burdens and cares and labor and shame and guilt and disgrace. Yes. All that mattered after that was that he had found her. And she had met the one who could deliver her life from destruction. Yes. Yes. All she had to look forward to was a hard life and a terrible end. But now she has hope for eternity. Now the disciples had their bellies full and their physical appetites were satisfied. But Jesus told them that he had meat to eat that they knew not of. Because <laughs> they tried to get him to eat. The, they came, the woman left. They marveled that he spoke to the woman. They said, here, we brought you some food. He said, I have meat to eat you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I think that's 
amazing. It's a thing to really consider because the disciples were as blind as she was, seemed to me like. And that about the state of the church, and it ain't supposed to be that way. It ain't supposed to be that way. Not now. Not since the Holy Ghost has come. We've been reading in the first of Acts, and boy, sure made a difference. Oh, Peter was so bold and so sharp with his preaching that they'd kill the Lord, and he God had raised him from the dead. And I mean, it was convincing and convicting. Different than here. What did they care about after that? You know, the church, the early... What are we doing now? The churches are in the same shape as these disciples were. I can't... You know, and it's been that way for years. You know, I've been... I remember going to meetings and the biggest thing was going to McDonald's after the service is over or going somewhere and eating somewhere. You know, that was a big thing. Everybody enjoyed that. They'd go and endure the preaching just to get to do that. And it wasn't about, you know, burden and care for people and souls of men. We've lost the burden. We're not faithful to the to the commission we've been given. Because we're not looking. We're chasing after our own cares. We're hungry all the time for the world and the things of the world. We're thirsting after the things of the world. I imagine she was thirsty when she came to the well too. You reckon? She went away. Thirsty physically, but not thirsty spiritually. It overrides. Jesus hadn't eaten. Was he desperate to get some food? No, he didn't want to eat. He had meat to eat. But they didn't know anything about it. He wasn't hungry. Did you ever get so full of, of God and joy and wonder at it all that the last thing you're thinking about is eating? Their minds were fixed on the earthly as the woman's was. No wonder he said, look on the fields. Now I'm just about done. If we're honest right now, we'd have to admit that we're more like the disciples than the woman and the woman than Jesus. And that's why the world around us continues to perish. When are we going to get a real burden? for the lost around us and the lost among us and be more concerned about the perishing than we are about our own cares and needs. Is it ever going to happen before Jesus comes? I wonder, is it? I've been around a lot of different people. You know, I can give you some names of people that I've been with through the years that really cared and had a burden for souls. They were always kind of oddballs. And they may have went about it in an awkward way sometimes. But I think I've known a few people that really did care. They just couldn't hardly let somebody go by without saying something. Without and I don't mean just cornering them up in a corner and saying, now look, you got to pray this prayer. Now I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just saying a word for God. Just pointing somebody in that direction. You reckon those disciples met that woman on the way to town? She's going to the well, they're going to town. Never paid no attention. If they did, they never paid any attention to her. Just a woman. They just passed her by just like we do somebody we meet on the highway. Or somebody that we're pushing our cart around in Walmart. It 
It would have been a terrible grief to Jesus that they were that way, except for the fact that He knew and He had hope because He knew what was coming for them. We need to have that kind of hope here this morning too. We need to realize, man, these, what are these children going to do in this generation? Here we go. What are they going to be? What are they going to do? What are they going to be able to do? Well, that's God's business and God's work. Our business today is to preach the Word of God just like this. Teach, preach, exhort, rebuke so that God can pick out and use the ones that are prepared. It always is a surprise to me. And it always has been through all ages. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty are chosen. God picks the one who's sitting there listening nobody thinks he is. God's working in hearts that that we have no idea about. That we look over. We just walk around them and go on. We'll be praying. That's what he said. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his feet. Jesus came to a world that was lost just like what we live in. And that's what he saw. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what he did. That's what he went about doing. You ever do that? You ever? Do you ever go in a store and just look at everybody that you're meeting in the aisles? And do you think about them? Do you look at them and think, you know, they got a life. They got a. There's a house they live in. There's a car out there they drive. There's people that know them. That maybe they have children. What's their life like? Do they know God? Do What do they know about God? When this is all over, where are they going to be? In the lake of fire forever? Or are they going to be in eternity with God? Can you make a difference? Yes. We're the light of the world. That's why we're here. That's why we're still here. Is because we're to preach the gospel to every creature. We're to look at every soul and be aware. Look on the fields and be aware that the harvest truly is plenteous. It's great. But the labors are few. So hypocritical of us. It shows what we really are. When the blackberries get ripe, everybody's out there, man, look at all this. You know, if you get in a strawberry patch or a blueberry patch or an apple orchard or anywhere. I mean, when the harvest is in, it's just grab all you can get. Hallelujah. But we look on the souls of men and Jesus said, they're ready, they're ready. There's more ready than you think are ready. The fields are white. Don't say wait three more months. Now. You know people and so do I right now that are ready What's well, going to happen? They're going to just rot on the vine and drop off. While we're busy going to town to get meat. Providing for ourselves and not what we want. How much time do we spend? How much effort do we spend? How much time do you pray? How much, you know, how much do you do to reach out to others in any way? There's a million things you can do. I've said that ever since we started the church, you know. There's nursing homes, there's hospitals, there's jails. There's people everywhere. There's babies die. I've seen them in the last two weeks. People lost babies. Don't you know they're they're hurting? Do you know what it means to them for somebody to just reach out? 
We used to do that a little bit. You know, we people that lost... A, I remember a teenager got killed in a car wreck at the bluff. We sent a card to the family. They responded and appreciated it. We did it as a church, but we could all do that individually. Just have a, a heart for people and care and reach out. Make a difference more than we can imagine. Father, thank you for the Word of God and thank you for the message this morning here from this chapter that we've read so many times. So many have preached on it. It's been known through all the ages here this morning. At the well. It's inexhaustible. Everything I've said here this morning, there's a hundred times more stuff to, and truths and applications to be drawn from it. But please help us this morning to realize that the lost are out there. And Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to care and to reach out to them. Give us the wisdom, the understanding, the opportunity. Give us the heart to look for the opportunity. Souls are perishing. Help us, Lord, to do what we can while we can. In Jesus' name, amen.